Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum. So pleased to be here with you this evening and really excited about tonight's event. A couple of years ago, Evie Lovett, a photographer based here in Southern Vermont, whom we've worked with on a number of different projects in the past, told us about this great project put together by the Vermont Folklife Center, having to do with the history and the ongoing practice of ice fishing here in Brattleboro in an area we call the Retreat Meadows, which is where the West River empties into the Connecticut River. The project is a collaboration between photographer Federico Pardo, who's made the most incredible photographs of the ice shanties on the meadows, and ethnographer Ned Castle, who interviewed many of the shanty owners. Thanks to Evie, this great collabor collaboration between Federico and Ned is now on view at the Brattleboro Museum. And it's prompted us to do a deep dive into ice fishing this winter. In addition to their exhibit, we have amazing photos by Eric Hoffner of frozen over ice fishing holes on view in an adjacent gallery at the museum. And uh, in addition to this conversation that we're having tonight, we're also presenting a talk by Eric on February 11th and a panel discussion with a number of people involved in ice fishing in Vermont on February 16th. But maybe most exciting of all, um, Federico and Ned's work inspired us to team up with Brattleboro's Retreat Farm to present the inaugural Artful Ice Shanties Design Build Competition, which is underway now and will be on view at Retreat Farm and on the Retreat Meadows from February 13th to February 28th. So I really want to thank Federico and Ned for providing us with all this inspiration this winter at a time when we've really needed it. And I especially want to thank Evie for her role in making all of this happen and for kindly agreeing to facilitate tonight's conversation between Federico and Ned. So in just a moment, I'm gonna uh, bring them on, Evie and Federico and Ned. They're going to talk about the project and then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. So please stick around for that. If there are questions or comments that occur to you during the conversation and you're here via Zoom, please use the Q&A button on your screen to type them in and then we'll get to them at the end during the Q&A. If you're watching the live stream on Facebook, uh, you can type in the comments there and we'll keep an eye on those too. Um, the other way you can participate in the Q&A is to wait until it's actually underway at the, at, after the talk. And then you, you can use the raise hand button on your screen, which will signal us to unmute you. And you can ask your question yourself rather than typing it in. Okay, with all that said, I think we're ready to go here. So. Please give a warm welcome wherever you are to Evie Lovett, Federico Pardo, and Ned Castle. Hi, everybody. Um, I am so excited to be here tonight um, because not only am I just a huge admirer of Fed and Ned's work, but they're also pretty fabulous human beings, really interesting. So um, I think you're in for a treat. So by way of introduction, Federico Pardo is a Colombian biologist, a photographer, a filmmaker. He specializes in natural history, the environment and human stories. He received a National Geographic grant in 2019 for photography of endangered primates in Colombia. Uh, he's received two Emmy Awards for work with both National Ge Geographic and Univision, um, the latter a uh, program on the Amazon. And it is no exaggeration to say that this guy is constantly on the move. Um, he has worked across much of Latin America. He's covered a wide variety of subjects. Um, a few days ago, he returned from the Galapagos where he was documenting a scientific inquiry. Um, and then among many other creative roles um, and educational roles, he manages a Latin American based photo workshop. Uh, 
Uh, his photos have been exhibited throughout the world. His documentaries have been screened at multiple film festivals and media outlets like National Geographic and HBO and Fox Sports. Um, and he's a 2020 National Geographic Explorer, which is a really big deal. Uh, and I've known Fed for about 10 years and, and I'm just consistently struck by this incredible interest and enthusiasm that he brings to, to the world around him. Um, it's just this incredibly genuine thing that I think you'll, you'll get a sense of. Um, and Ned, um, Ned Castle is a cultural researcher, a videographer. He has a background in ethnographic filmmaking and he works with media in cultural research, occasional commercial contexts that emphasize collaboration and engagement with the ethics of representation. Um, and this approach is influenced by more than a decade working as a researcher and media producer at the Vermont Folklife Center, where I had the privilege to collaborate with him. Um, he runs an independent video production company called Frames to Life. And what I wanna share about Ned is that he is someone who has spent his professional life really deeply considering the question of the ethics of representation. You know, who, who gets to tell what stories and how, and he has deep convictions on this subject. So uh, ice shanties, Fed began documenting the ice shanties in 2016, continued over the course of three winters. Um, and these are just luminous images. I really encourage you all to get to the museum and see them in person. Um, so how did a Colombian biologist come to be photographing the ice shanties at the Retreat Meadows in Brattleboro, Vermont in the dead of night? And how did he connect with a Vermont Folklife Center ethnographic researcher? And how did this remarkable project come together? Um, Fed, can, can you bring us into it? Can you walk us through how this um, project started for you? Sure. Um, thank you, Evie, for the great introduction. Hello, Ned. Very happy to be here. And hello, everyone who's watching. And um, the project, I think it started one day or one afternoon. I was driving close by the meadows and I saw these things on the ice, like these structures that I had never seen before. I'm, I'm Colombian. I had lived in the US for a few years already and had endured a few winters, but I had never seen, you know, something popping up from the ice. Uh, so I went around the meadows, I drove my car and I saw that there were houses. Uh, little did I know that they were fishing houses. Um, so eventually next weekend or something, this was January of 2016, I decided to go see what was all about. And uh, yeah, there they were, these funny looking houses uh, that people were using to go ice fishing. And I snapped a few photos during the day, but something didn't really quite connect. I, I, was, I was happy with what I was doing, but uh, I, I wanted to go a little deeper and try to capture more of the atmosphere of what was happening. The ice changes, the, the footprints or the tracks on the snow, everything that was, that, that frozen life that I was seeing during the day, I wanted to give it a little more of a, a dreamy atmosphere, if you will. So I came back at night and I started taking photos and I think that's how it started. So can you, can you describe a night? You know, what, what is for you from sort of start to finish? Sure. Uh, the first few nights were really cold. Uh, I, I don't think I dressed up properly and I don't think I knew what it meant to be walking around frozen ice for three, four hours. Uh, I was also a little nervous. I, I, I knew the eyes would be hard enough, but when you're by yourself at 8, 9 p.m. Uh, on the eyes, thinking that it, you can fall through, uh, I was nervous. But at the beginning of the project, I started photographing, say, around 7, 8 p.m., and uh, the photos were okay, but I would get a lot of light streaks from the cars still driving behind. Um, so I decided to start going a little later, around 9, 10 p.m., and stayed until midnight. That way I would get more of the solitude of the, of, the, of the city of Brattleboro and the atmosphere of the lonely uh, ice shanties. Um, every day I would go, I would try to photograph at 
least five, six shanties uh, from different angles. Uh, it was it was somewhat easy, but I, I didn't want to, for example, uh, put my footprints in the photo. So I would always have to work my way through the eyes to get to that point where I wanted to photograph a shanty without putting my footprints and then walk to the other one. And uh, yeah, just like that. And during the freezing winters of Vermont. And uh, yeah, that's, that's roughly how it went. So did you have an idea of what you were kind of like a vision of what you wanted to photograph or how did it, how did this kind of long exposure concept no, I, on? Honestly, it's one, it's one of those beautiful surprise moments of, of photography. Uh, I had taken some photos during the day, but the sky and the contrast and the white snow didn't quite make the, the aesthetic that I, that I wanted. So the first time I went out at night and I put my tripod and I snapped, I think a couple of minutes photo, things started to connect. I was like, wow, this is weird. This looks different. And the reason was the moon reflecting on the snow plus some of the background lights were giving this eerie atmosphere, this dreamlike atmosphere that uh, I, I was not expecting. Now, we humans were not uh, used to seeing things in long exposure, meaning the camera captures 15, 20 seconds at a time, and that conveys a different look to what our eyes see. Because when we were there, I would just see the pitch black. I would see some of the gray of the, of the snow, but eventually with a 15, 20 second exposure, all the light would add up and bring this day-like dreamy atmosphere, even though it was, mid well, not midnight, but dark. Um, the stars started popping up and I realized that the stars were a, a key element for the, for the night uh, setting of the, of the photos. So I want them to be uh, stars. So I kept the exposure, exposure around 15 to 20 seconds. Otherwise, if you go longer, they start becoming dashes, little streaks as Earth rotates around the sun. So uh, that was my, my sweet spot, 15 to 20 seconds with a fairly fast lens. I think it was a 35 millimeter 1.4 uh, for those people who like the tech stuff. Uh, and yeah, that, that made it. That was the recipe. And so I just went for it. So let's bring in Fed, uh, Ned. Um, Ned, how, what sort of pulled you to Fed's photos when, when you saw them? Because if I'm, I may be incorrect about this, had you totally finished um, photographing Fed? Had you completed the project? Had gotten involved? I think we added some photos. I completed the photograph. We yeah, we met with Ned and then I think I did some more photos and then uh, creativity started. Yeah, I can try to sort of answer how I got into this. And I think maybe it's helpful to give a little background that, um, you know, Evie mentioned this in, in her introduction um, that I have worked with the Vermont Folklife Center for 10 years. And I'll go back just a bit and say that um, I, my background in kind of media making is photography, um, which, you know, will be relevant as we get further along in the story. And I had done, um, you know, I was sort of interested in photographing people and I'd done some kind of really rough interviews. But when I, when I sort of found myself at the Folklife Center, um, I, I sort of, I talk about it sort of like finding a home in, in the sort of emphasis on people and, and how you sort of represent people. And so um, a time that I met uh, Fed, I, I was working as the director of our uh, vision and voice gallery at the Vermont Folklife Center. And the, the goal of that um, gallery program is really to um, represent the diverse uh, people and cultures of Vermont, to showcase uh, work by artists all along the, the spectrum from student to professional, um, and to do, to do so with the intention of making people more visible to one another. And um, so with that background in mind, I, I met, um, well, I think Evie actually, we're, we're gonna put the, um, point it back to Evie a little bit. Evie had sent me um, Fed's portfolio. And um, from a photography standpoint, I was captivated. And I, and I think this is just a trigger to, to remind me, I think we should pull up some of the photos, Fed, and have you say, you know, explain some of the things you were um, explaining earlier about shadow and light and stars. I think it's sort of fascinating to look at that. 
maybe it's fascinating to me because I'm into photography, but um, I remember seeing the images and being blown away. Um, and then also thinking about them in the context of the Folk Life Center and what we um, do there, the, the, you know, there's an aesthetic component to, the, to, to an, an exhibit that sort of fits with the Vision and Voice Gallery. And there's also kind of a context and storytelling. And Fed's work um, was really an, a fascinating sort of a survey of like vernacular um, architecture. You know, he, you know, they're sort of framed very sort of similarly. It sort of like puts the, the shanties themselves forward, whether this was his um, sort of intention or not um, to the sort of ethnographers in the room. It was like a really um, interesting survey. And then immediately uh, those of us at the Folk Life Center were like, well, we want to know about the fishers. Um, and so I remember kind of reaching out to Fed or sort of setting up that uh, first meeting, you know, with a little bit of, of curiosity, concern, like trepidation to like say, hey, Fed, this is like this amazing body of aesthetic, um, you know, artistic photos. Um, how do you feel about adding in stories of the people? And he was like all over it. And so I think that was the point at which this became um, really a sort of a, a collaboration was to see his openness to kind of have, uh, you know, a, another sort of group of people engage with his work and, and build on it. And so that's, that's really how it started. And I give Fed a lot of credit, you know, that um, it, isn't, it isn't every artist that is willing to kind of allow their initial vision to be built on um, in, in such a way. And, and I think, um, I think uh, Fed deserves a lot of credit for being open, open to this and, and kind of allowing it to happen because of that. So what was the draw there, Fed? Like, how did you, how were you open to this? Yes, uh, well, I also have to acknowledge uh, Ned's drive to collaborate and, and uh, to make it happen. And, and the way it worked was, I think, a little organic in the sense that I had tried connecting, connecting with some of the people, some of the fishermen in one of my daily outings during the weekends. I would come up to their shanty and with my camera, with my accent, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a photographer. But I, I couldn't really get across. I couldn't really like, quote unquote, break the ice and, and snap some photos and get uh, through their life. So, uh, I, I suppose it's a little bit with the culture of the region, also the, the the idea of being out in the ice fishing on a weekend by yourself. You don't want somebody with a camera bothering you maybe. So the human element was lacking. I was aware of that. I wanted to do some portraits. I wanted to get uh, to know the people, but I, I, I couldn't. And I was also traveling quite a bit by that time. So I only had a few weekends during the winter to do this. So when Ned, uh, when I started talking with Ned and he was like, okay, why don't we uh, start talking with a, the with a fisherman? I was like, awesome. Ned is a local, he's an ethnographer. I think it'll make things easier for me. And uh, that's what happened. Uh, I, I, gladly, I was able to, to retrieve some of the phone numbers from the fishermen from the ice shanties. I think they have to have their number there by law or something for the fish and wildlife. So we did a little like just reporting on it. Ned would call some of them and uh, talk about the project and uh, eventually that became the, the, the human side of the story, which after the curation, I thought it was very, very uh, appropriate because we had the shanties sort of portrayed on a very uh, biographical way or taxonomical way themselves. And we wanted also to give the human side, the culture side, uh, a fair amount of, of space. And the interviews that Ned captured, I think, really delve into that uh, fishing culture of, of this region of Vermont. So Ned, I, I can just add quickly some, some kind of um, details to that early phase. I, re I, I remember like Fed, you sending me these shots on my cell phone of the of the names and stuff on because you're right they, they have to have them on there in case you know you don't you don't get your shanty off in time this is my understanding you don't get your shanty off in time and fish and wildlife can come find you you know your shanty sitting there in the spring in the water 
So we, we use those to like track everybody down. And I remember, you know, I like had one day where I made like 10 phone calls and I didn't get us anybody I left a bunch of messages. And um, the first person to call me back was Roy Gangloff, who I, I think maybe he and his wife are listening right now. Um, and, uh, you know, Roy sort of feeling me out a little bit. What is this about? And we spent some time chatting and I think I could give him, you know, the, the context of what we were trying to do and where we were going. Um, and then from that point on, I would just tell people, oh, yeah, like I talked to Roy, you know? Um, so I do think it, it's, it's, I think it's like a lot of communities. I, I, I think, you know, there people have their individual dispositions to how open they are. And I, I've talked to some of the fishers about this, this sort of how they feel on the ice with people kind of coming up with questions. Um, but Roy really was a gatekeeper um, to the, to the, the community and one of, one of the uh, audio uh, bits from uh, Chad Ives, he, he re references um, Roy as the godfather down there. So we, we got in touch with the godfather early on and it uh, made things a lot easier. Thank so, you, Roy. Um, did, I'd love to hear, I think everyone would love to hear more about um, some of the stories that were shared. I don't know if you guys think it would be good to play them or maybe just to, I, mean, I was really blown away when I listened to them at the, just the breadth. I mean, there's sort of, there's like philosophy, there's action, you know, there's these great stories of sort of a, an ice shanty hurling towards somebody across the, you know, the ice and, yeah, why maybe pull, we have time. Here. You can play one. Yeah, why don't I pull one up? I'll pull up since we were um, talking about him. Um, let me see if I can get to um, Roy Shanny here, everybody. Just hang on one second. Okay. We'll see and hear from Roy here. And then Fed, I'm excited to maybe we can we can go through some of the photos and you can point out some of the those technical aspects we were talking about at the beginning. Um, sure. I, I I for one would love to to hear that. So um, this is a this is a clip this is a clip from Roy that I think is actually kind of a just a good introduction to shanty culture, the people and experiences behind the buildings. The ice shanty, the Bob House, uh, they've been around a long time. Um, you know, a lot of guys will, will use press board or particle board or whatever because it's inexpensive. But that soaks up water, you know, when things start to bow and bend and kind of break down and fall apart. Um, you know, a lot of them shanties that come out are built like the day before the ice sets in. And there's no time to paint them or nothing like that. So they just push them out as is. And... Uh, uh, there's there's not too many shanties that are as old as that one. Boy, my kids were fairly young. That one was probably built around all well, the time Russell went to school, a couple years before that. I'm going to say probably, we probably had that now for about 25 years. I just happened to be driving by, and I think they probably had one wall up, so I pulled over, and I saw that they had... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, standing steam roofing metal there, and I says, Russ, where, where did I? I says, what, you must have spent a fortune on that. And he says, nope. He says, uh, this came from some construction project, and it was basically just leftover scraps. And I'm like, damn, I'm like, that'll make one hell of a shanty. Uh, it'll not only be durable, I said, it'll be fairly lightweight. And uh, uh, we used to move that from time to time, and um, had a couple accidents moving it. <laughs> <laughs> One was right after we put the brand new roof on. We ended up uh, had the trailer just a little bit tilted, and uh, the guys that were there to help me were they were kind of anxious, I guess, and kind of talked me into, "Oh, it'll be all right." Well, it wasn't all right. <laughs> it fell off that trailer and uh, knocked the brand new roof right off. But uh, fortunately, we had a screw gun and a, uh, and a and a box of screws. We screwed it back together and put it out. Uh, one other time, we were bringing it to a uh, fishing derby, pulling it with a snowmobile. 
I forget now if the the rope broke or the incline on the hill was was just too much and the shanty went for a pretty pretty good ride down the hill and ended up crashing into a tree <laughs> um, we kind of more or less fixed that with a two by four bending and banging and and uh, it, it shows a little bit of wear and tear but it's generally it's in pretty good shape so i i, I like sharing that one because i think it kind of gives you a sense of you know, both from the construction, the longevity of these things and the, how they've been through a lot, you know, they're sort of sitting there when you, when you drive by, but they've, they have a whole sort of life of their own, some of them. I love it. I love it because it definitely complements what I do not see by taking the photos. Uh, it adds up so much depth and history and culture to the shanties. And uh, yeah, after you and Ed got these interviews, I was the project just grew up so much, at, at least on my perspective, after having photographed all of these houses or the shanties. Do you want me to move through a few, Fed, and you can explain a little bit of that technique? Because even as a person who is sort of hip to a lot of uh, photo technique, I actually find this to be really unique and um, special, what you're able to capture here with the moonlight and the different uh, sort of Sure. Um, maybe let's start with this one that has a couple of good elements. Uh, at first, when I started showing the photos and saying these are night photos, people would be, but how? Like, what, what, what's night? What's nocturnal about them? And I was, well, first you see the stars on the sky. Uh, in these ones, they're a little dim because it happened that on when we had, when there was a, a brighter moon or a bigger moon, uh, the sky lightens up, so stars are not as noticeable. But secondly, you also see the, the lights on the background, the city lights. And on the left, you see some uh, car lights, some streaks from the cars that are going on I-91. Uh, but these are elements that I, I started thinking, okay, the only way we can see street lights or urban lights is if I photograph at night. And the moon is also giving us so much of a fill, fill meaning uh, uh, lighting up everything that it becomes light, daylight. Uh, and this I loved, the, the ethereal feeling. Uh, if you move forward, we can go over a few other ones. Um, that one, for example, uh, when I realized that the moon was causing so much of a difference between uh, exposures or, or feelings of the or the way the, the night would look uh i would come back two weeks later on a different moon phase and in this case there was barely any moon so you have a darker sky that becomes purple and uh but you still have some of the background lights of this of the houses nearby um, and the shadow in this case you see that the shanty has a shadow towards the back uh back left uh that is i think the light coming from the retreat the actual building that's uh, on the other side or behind me. So it's not only the moon that's lighting up the shanties, there's this big building that has some big lights that luckily was also helping me lighten up the atmosphere. Um, and yeah, the pink glow, or this one, yes, this one's, this one's my favorite and uh, some other people really like it too. Uh, this one, I think I was very lucky because uh, for those who live in the area, uh, you may have been aware that I-91 had the the, bill, the bridge rebuilt or there was this build, bridge construction for a few years and the glow coming behind the shanty are the lights of the bridge itself. Uh, I think they would leave the lights on or there would be construction happening at night. So I was lucky enough to be able to put the house right in front of those lights of the bridge of I-91 uh, That's and took the photo. And that's why you see this shadow that comes from the shanty towards the camera, towards me, that in my mind helps you draw in the, the, the perspective, the, the viewer's attention into the beautiful red shanty with green roof and the purple sky uh, full of stars. Maybe one more, let's see what we have. Uh, love it. Uh, in this one, in this case, you can see I-91 still with a few cars in the background. And uh, this is why I started photographing a little later. I, around nine, eight o'clock at night, uh, 
well, it's dark in the winter, but you would have lots of cars driving by behind the shanties. And I didn't want that. I, I, I thought it would draw attention to the cars and the background rather than to the shanty. So I started going out later at night to avoid street lights. Uh, of course, I couldn't control the cars, but in this case, I can see that, or we can see that there's only a few cars co going by and then the sky and the clouds and the shanty itself uh, gets all the attention. You know, as I look at these and it's so great to see them, I I'm struck again by how much they are about place, um, both the images and the audio. And we're in such a, I mean, it's such a sad time because, you know, here we are in the pandemic, um, being able to show this body of work um, locally, which has such local connection. Um, and yet, you know, it's not as, um, it's as accessible as we would like it to be. Um, it did show at the Folklife Center um, a year or so ago, and you did have a chance to sort of, in a group context, get a lot of um, feedback from 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 Vermonters. And can can you share with us a little bit about how that was to have your work um, experienced by people with kind of felt with with knowledge of of what you were photographing and um, and showing. Sure. Uh, it was a novel experience because I'm not a ice fisherman. I'm not a Vermonter. I'm a documentary photographer, filmmaker, and biologist. So when I presented the work to, to the people who know about this, of course, they had lots of questions and insights and ideas popping up in their heads that I was not aware of. Uh, so the, the, the bridging of those two cultures, me as a foreigner, as a distant observer, uh, paired to that knowledge of the locals that had the culture and had seen these for, for generations, was, it was not a clash of two worlds, but it was like the, the, the friendship of two worlds. I knew a lot from, the, I learned a lot from them. And uh, honestly, it was also an enriching experience because spending all the nights there by myself, I could only wonder what would happen inside the shanties or what a day in the ice would be fishing there. And uh, then talking with the people and sharing our experience, it just made the project or it made me richer, I think, as a photographer uh, obsessed with these things. In, and in this photo, I, I should highlight, I think there's a satellite uh, right above the shanty there that you can see the, the dash, the, the long streak of dots just uh, with a faint line. Uh, and that I think we counted earlier, there's 14 dots. So I think it may be a, four, a 15 second exposure. Uh, and I assume the satellite has a, a, a light that goes off every second or so. Um, and in some other photos, I don't know if we have some of those, Ned, if you, if you go a little further. That one, for example, I, I still don't know what the tree is for. Some of the shanties had elements to them, around them that uh, I, I wouldn't know. Like the, the tree, I suppose it was for the wind or to block, uh, yeah, I guess the wind where the wind is blowing from to, to avoid it hitting the, the fishing hole. That's my assumption, but I don't know. But you also see how the ice changes. So I started noticing that snow is not one element. It's, it's or, or one thing. Snow, it's a combination of different faces of water. And I would go one night and it would be flat eyes like this and sketchy because I would slip or it would be a little dusted like the previous one uh, that, would, that would keep some of the frozen tracks on the, on, the, on the snow. And that would make me imagine or dream about what would be happening during the day. Oh, the person drove through here and they would walk through, through this path to, to look at their uh, other holes where they were fishing. So, it became sort of a, a, a universe or a life that I was photographing during the night, but that it was happening at, during the day. And then as the season progressed, everything would change. So, so for me, it's still like a life that I don't see, but I just imagine. And thanks to the night and the, and the dreamlike exposure or, or feel of it, 
uh, I love it. It makes me imagine all sorts of things that happen during the day. And how did the, the, the bringing in of the audio, I mean, how did that change? I mean, you talked about it as being really transformative. How, how did it change the, the, the work for you? Well, it, it was the perfect compliment uh, because the interviews came almost at the end of me photographing most of the shanties. So once I heard what was happening, it all made sense. It was like, oh, now I get it. Now I know why this shanty has a, a, a skull on the side or why this one looks like this. Or, well, it just brought up the human life and the human element and the culture to the shanty. So I like to think of this as, as ice shanty portraits paired with uh, ice shanty culture and, and ice fishing culture. And that sort of emb embodies this micro universe of, of this part of Vermont. Ned, can you share a little more with us about the experience of interviewing and like, did you, um, have you gotten feedback from, from people that you connected with? Um, how, how did they respond to the photographs? Mm -hmm. um, sure, I, uh, sort of the, the process that we use at the Vermont Folklife Center is ethnography and a, and a certain sort of type of ethnography called collaborative ethnography. And so right from the beginning, when I would go to interview um, anyone, I would explain that, okay, we're going to do this two hour interview. Um, the idea is that we'll sort of cut out some bits and that are sort of poignant or that relate to the imagery and the photographs or that sort of highlight the culture and that you'll get a chance to listen to those and sort of approve them. And so I think that process opens people up. I tend to like conduct interviews pretty openly. Uh, my mentor at the Folklife Center, Greg Shero, sort of taught me to um, really like be willing to explore where the person wants to take you and also to like be on the lookout for like things people are excited to talk about. So, um, you know, maybe I can share one more uh, audio. Um, it's, it's, you know, we, we started out talking about the shanty, it's Chad Ives shanty. And, um, you know, he and I got to talking about stuff that was like a little bit further away from ice fishing, but still, I think really fascinating to, to think about how he approaches that. So um, maybe I'll play this short clip um, of Chad, if that's, does that sound okay to the two of you? Okay, hang on one second. Basically, because I kind of look around at society and I'm I'm going, what what is going on here? You know, like people don't even understand where the food and the grocery market comes from and what kind of an impact that has. And I feel like the more you deny, you know, your I guess your animalistic nature of, you know, eating and, you know, being the apex predator, the further we get away from actual the nature of ourselves really what drove me to it was producing my own food, you know, growing food in the garden or, uh, you know, shooting a deer and processing it and actually, you know, or raising chickens or whatnot. And once you go through that process and you understand, you know, that you are taking a life and there is a major gravity to it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you know, harvest, I, I, I kind of don't like to say harvest, but I don't like to say kill. I've killed a lot of animals and each one weighs fairly heavily on me because of my perspective, you know, like it's, it was a life. It was, you know, everything's got a place. Like that's, there's no one more cruel than mother nature, you know, being an outdoorsman, I, you know, the stuff that mother nature does is horrifying, you know, compared to what maybe I do as a hunter or fisher. Um, yeah, there's just, you know, I hate, I don't like seeing a dead animal really at all, period. You know, I see the, you know, squirrel on the side of the road and I hate it. You know, I can't stand the fact that, you know, we as humans have made these roads and they're killing animals and, you know, ruining the environment. But I think, you know, knowing even though I'm a hunter and a fisher and I kill animals and, you know, eat animals, um, it doesn't mean that I don't care about them and don't respect them and understand their role 
in you know the planet it's uh that's kind of hard because if somebody was sitting here and said they don't eat meat because they don't want to kill an animal i fully respect that that's you know that's putting you know your money where your mouth is but if somebody was going to sit here and say why are you going to kill these wild animals when you can just go to the grocery store and buy this meat that's somebody who i'd i'd try to convince otherwise because you know these commercial farms that develop this meat they're atrocious you know they're just unbelievably terrible and don't deny reality because not everything shows up in styrofoam and saran wrap on it you know there was a real live animal behind that and yeah i don't know i kind of feel like that person that won't kill animals and won't eat meat sits down and i fully respect that because that, that's somebody coming to grips they're they're in tune with reality like they they understand that when you eat meat an animal is being killed you know whereas someone who you know a grocery store hunter you know or whatever grocery store person that goes to the grocery store and doesn't like hunting well i feel like that's a confusion because there's a disconnect between the animal and what they're eating I think a lot about that clip actually, because I, I, I love Chad's sort of like grocery store hunter. Um, and I definitely am a grocery store hunter. And I think there are moments I experience dissonance, the moments where I feel dissonance about some of my sort of philosophies, I can kind of like hear Chad saying that in my head. So um, I don't know that I answered your question very well, um, Evie, but I, I think th that's like the richness that gets added you know, this is the reverberation of Fed's openness to this and, and the participation of the fishers and to, is to sort of connect with that sort of philosophy and that person, you know, beyond the shanty, beyond the technique of fishing to kind of like what orients him in the world. So that's, that's uh, really interesting to me. That one really got me. Um, and it, it sort of underscored how there's so much that surprises you about um, this body of work um, and that it's, unex it's unexpected um, and it's sort of deep, deeply moving. It says Ice Channies, but we're also talking about, you know, living. <laughs> um, so I, I want to have people, you know, a chance for folks to ask, ask questions, but I want to ask one more question um, of you both, if I may. Um, before turning it over to Danny and and to folks who also have questions, you and my question is, um, I, I'm wondering what you're doing now. What, where are you now, and how has this project, you know, informed where you're going? Well, um, continuing with the previous or with uh, Chad's answer, I think the re our relationship as humans with the environment, it's. It's very present right now, right? We are going through a, a crazy time, the pandemic, uh, that is the result of probably a, a weird connection of ourselves with the environment or a disconnection maybe. Um, so I'm currently working on a project that's focused on helping save Colombia's most endangered primates. Uh, I've realized that with my media skills and my interest for the, for the nature, natural world, I wanted to do something that really had tangible actions, positive tangible actions on the environment. So the idea is to build a multimedia exhibit uh, that will connect Colombians to, to endangered monkey species. And by each of the persons or by each person that goes through the exhibit, we will bring, we will plant one tree in the monkey's ecosystem. So it, it, I think it, it connects a little bit of everything that we're talking about here. It's uh, me capturing the natural world, uh, bringing it to people who are not really aware or uh, they don't really know the monkeys that live in Colombia, uh, as I didn't know about ice fishing in Vermont. And then how can I use that to make uh, the, the monkeys environment a little better? So I've partnered with some conservation organizations. So in the long run, by connecting each Colombian to the monkey's forest, we can also bring a tree to the forest and help uh, the monkeys in the long run. Uh, that's what's keeping me busy, even though I just finished a shoot in Galapagos of a scientific 
uh, expedition, uh, the monkeys, it's what uh, keeps me awake at night. That's so cool. We, Fed and I have sort of kept in touch on and off since this launch, but we haven't been in touch recently. And I had no idea you were doing that. It's really um, cool to hear. So um, congratulations and keep it up. Um, to answer briefly, uh, I'm working on a documentary about uh, three Special Olympics athletes. And I would say, I guess, how this is a continuation. I think it, my sort of practice was really forged I, in a lot of ways and informed by the methodology at the Vermont Folklife Center around collaboration and kind of in, I'm trying to understand the dynamics of power that exist. And, the, and those definitely are at play in you know, uh, myself as kind of an ally to the disability community working with people um, who identify as disabled to tell this story. Um, so I think I carry a lot of the lessons that I learned from um, folks at the Folklife Center, uh, Greg, Andy, Kathleen, um, and others, and, and even you, Evie, you know, sort of watching you work with Greg around um, backstage at the Rainbow Cattle Co., you know, just seeing that transformation that sort of happened for you, I think it inspired me. And, and, I, and I, I think I carry a lot of those lessons into the work that I'm doing now. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stop there and, and invite questions. I'm excited to hear uh, what people are curious about. I guess that's my cue. You guys, this has been so awesome and fascinating hearing more about the project. And I can't thank you enough for, for giving us this additional glimpse. It's so, you know, you give of yourself so much as artists in the first place, just creating the work and then, you know, giving us the opportunity to share it and then also to come on here and, and tell us more about it and um, really enrich our, you know, our whole appreciation and understanding. It really means a lot. And thank you to all, all three of you for that. Um, I see we have a hand up and I want to invite others to either type your questions into the Q&A box or, um, or use the raise hand button and I'll call on you. I just wanted to say a, a, a response to a couple things I heard uh, first before I, I turn it over. Um, Ned, this thing that you said about kind of like the guiding principle behind the um, that gallery at the Folk Life Center, like, like making Vermonters visible to one another. Was that, am I, am I ca capturing yeah, that right? That's right. Um, so one of the things that's been awesome about having this work up at the museum is uh, having people come in who definitely came in because they are connected to ice fishing and say that like they've lived in Brattleboro all their lives, but they've never come in here before, they've never come to the museum. And and also for our for like our kind of regular museum patrons um, to be looking at Fed's pictures and also dialing the numbers and listening to these stories, I just feel like the rubber's really hitting the road there. Like it's really happening. And I, I'm, you know, I'm sure it happens often with these amazing projects that the Folk Life Center does. And it happens sometimes with projects that we, we do at our museum. And it's so gratifying and, and exciting when it, when it does. I also didn't realize that the project began as photos and only later did the, like, that it wasn't conceived that way from the beginning, photos and stories. And um, the photos are obviously amazing. Like we would have shown these photos just as a photo exhibit without the stories. But boy, the stories like the, the one with the, you know, Roy's shanty careening down the hill. And uh, yeah, it's just the full gamut, as Evie was saying earlier, like action stories and philosophy. And the, the stories just enrich the, the whole, you know, the whole presentation so, so much. Um, it just came together beautifully. And I really commend you both and, and thank you. So, okay, um, I'd like to give others a chance to jump in here. So if anyone has questions or comments, please um, feel free to get involved. And so I'm gonna try, or Jessica, um, our events manager who's behind the scenes, I think I need to ask Jessica to unmute Julie, um, who has a question. So go ahead, Julie. Well, actually it's Julie sitting right here. Oh, it's Tim. Yeah, hi, hi guys. Um, okay. 
I just, I'm really struck because it just seems like this project does something so essential for what we need right now in terms of bridging a cultural gap. Because I, I would be the kind of person who would drive by these shanties and maybe wonder what was going, you know, what was going on inside. But it, it seems like you're taking two very different cultural kind of wings of society maybe and, and uniting them. And I guess it just, it takes a Colombian artist and a Vermont ethnographer to put it together, but it's a really beautiful thing that you've done. And I also think that it's, it's just really the kind of thing that we really, really need right now as a culture and as a world. So I commend you. I don't really have a question, but awesome stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. That's great to hear. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> There's a comment here. Someone's typed in on Facebook. Thank you for being an inspiration. I have a 16 year old who loves photography and it was awesome to see him engaged listening to the presentation. That's really great. Um, a question uh, for Fed. Did you, if you made it sound like you kind of stumbled onto the notion of doing the long exposure photography at night and you know, is that something you had really done before? Like, um, Yes, I had, I had, as a photographer and filmmaker, we oftentimes use long exposure as a tool to, to capture what we're looking at, whether it's the night sky or a time lapse. But oftentimes you don't, it can be like a gimmicky, right? It's something that you use yeah. to, to, to have the star trails or to have a bonfire or paint with uh, light painting and stuff. But when I was there at, at night on the ice and I snapped my first photo and things came up, you're like, wow, this is what long exposure was meant to be done. <laughs> it's like, this mm -hmm. is, you get, you get the atmosphere, you get the ice, you get the light, you get the shanty, you get the sky, you get the city in the background, but it's not, it doesn't look like long exposure. And I, I like that. It's, yeah. it's the perfect tool I thought for for this uh, element. So I had played with it, but I hadn't really found uh, the proper, the perfect uh, project to use it. So Fed, a question, if, if I can jump in, you know, there's a moment as an artist, as a photographer, where I think you, you're you like, yes, you know, and, 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 and I think you just expressed it. It's sort of like a, it's a visceral thing. Can you put words to it? It's hard. Uh, it is very visceral. Uh, I often, when I teach photo or sometimes I, I tell my students, you get to a place and you know there's a photo there. There's an image. There's a moment. There's something to be captured. You may not know what it is, but you see it and you walk around and you take a few snaps and then you go around and eventually you take it and you look at it and you're like, holy cow, there it is. And not only was the sky and the shanty, I think it was also the life that was absent from this landscape. Uh, looking at the, 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 the footprints on the ground, the holes, the fishing holes uh, next to the shanty, even the tree lying next to it is like, there's so much there that I can't see, that I don't understand, but it's there. Uh, and that's what I loved. Uh, it makes me just wonder what's happening here. Who's fishing here? Why did they walk this way and not that way? What truck did they use or a snowmobile? Uh, of course, I'm not a local, so all of those were, just uh, wondering thoughts and, and uh, yeah, that moment was, was it for me. I want to just add like um, having spent a lot of time on the meadows, I, I'm not, I should contextualize that having spent like several days down there, um, they're, they're like these photographs capture a certain essence that is would have been really hard to capture during the day because there's activity down there, like visually there's kind of a lot happening during the day. <laughs> but the experience is one of sort of solitude a little bit. And oftentimes, you know, you set up the tip ups or you're fishing inside the, the fishing shanty. So you, it's not, you know, people, they are, there's kind of an absence of human presence. And there's, it's like mostly the space of the sky and the ice. And so I just love these photographs. I think they, you know, at least for me, somebody who had some experience down there beyond the person who was just driving by, they really captured that aspect in like a magical way. Um, 
So I've said it before, but I just, these photos are just so special, Feb. Thank you, Matt. I couldn't have done it without you. It's interesting to think that it was a little, you know, kind of a little bit of unnatural circumstances, taking the pictures at night and with a long exposure in order to arrive at like really capturing that, the essence of that feeling um, that, that exists out there on the ice and with the shanties. Uh, but you know, now, now that you mention it, sorry to interrupt, I think it could have been also a little circumstantial. Like I remember the first day during the day, seeing the fishermen around and my camera being an element of disruption. So maybe I thought at that time, going at night, they won't be there. So I can get the photos I want. And that's when it happened, boom. And, uh, but yeah, it's a little bit of everything. And uh, I'm very happy with it. And uh, we didn't get to talk about them, but uh, there's also the, the other element of the, of the series, which are the fishes and the tips. Yeah. Uh, I needed more elements to, to sort of document the universe of what I was seeing. And those I did during the day. I, I want to jump ah. here also and say, um, you use this word, <laughs> am I going to pronounce it correctly? Taxonomic? Taxonomy or taxonomical. taxonomic. Yeah. Um, and there is definitely a, a style, um, a formality to the, these images. And I think you explained it to me once that, it, you know, you were talking about approaching it as a biologist. I, can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, taxonomy is the idea of ordering things, of classifying things. That's how we call uh, the classification of species. Uh, it's a taxonomical order. Uh, and I think my photography has a little bit of that. It's looking at things into standards or putting things into a standard way of, of, of seeing them or uh, photographing them. Uh, so with the shanties, uh, it's definitely uh, a one by one format or square format in which the shanty is always in the middle. Uh, we have the horizon line roughly at the same place. And what changes, it's the night, the sky, the light, and the elements around the shanty. So uh, on a biological side of side way of saying things, if you had a species, but only the environment is what changes. Well, I'm sort of describing this species uh, as, pure, as purely as I can. And then during the day, I would go back and, and photograph the rest of the elements, like the fishes or the tips. And I would see there were some green ones and some pink ones and sort of uh, try to use the same aesthetic taxonomical order or uh, aesthetical classification of things, if you want. Uh, to convey the same idea and keep it all into the same universe. Um, and yeah, that, that would be my biological brain mixing with a photographical, photographic brain. And one of the things that I love about that um, is it, it accentuates the shanties themselves, like the differences in them because they're sort of, they're photographed in a standardized way, you know, the, the, the fact that they're different sizes and they are different building materials and they sort of have different constructions. It just kind of pushes that um, uniqueness forward, at least, at least for me. And that's such a big part of the culture, at least as I understand it is like, you know, these things are made from what most of the time people have laying around and most of the time what their sort of individual carpentry skills are. You know, some people are very, you know, um, do very refined carpentry. Um, Steve uh, Hazley's, uh, the one that you said that is one of your favorite, that is all made of mahogany and he's got hidden compartments and like lowering tables and things in it. And others are like so bare bones, just, you know, like le really light, just the, the metal on the outside and all like repurposed materials. And I love how that just comes through so loud and clear that that diversity comes through really loud and clear by your kind of, um, you know, your, your, your approach fed. And also the way that you have, have created the labels for the show, Ned, right? Can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, we, we, and again, this is one of these, like, I'm like, come up with this idea to uh, create labels that mimic the, you know, Vermont fish and game, uh, fishing license format. And I'm like, you know, sort of proposing it to Fed, you know, like, what do you think of this? Like, 
<laughs> and he's like, yes, let's do it. It's like, it, it sort of shows the sort of culture and the, and the sort of connection. And um, so, so those kind of, again, are giving you kind of some hidden information um, about uh, what's happening. I can quickly show you one example, like uh, that shanty that we were talking about, um, Steve's. So you can't see inside it, um, but you know, here we got his amenities. He's got an office chair, a heater, bench with legs that fold up for storage, <laughs> light radio, and my favorite hidden compartments. <laughs> he also has, you know, there's kind of different uh, techniques of fishing. And again, you have to understand that I'm, I'm like a second, uh, uh, I, this is sort of like second language for me. So I'm relaying information. So take it with a grain of salt. But as I understand, you know, there's, there's jigging, which is often done kind of like you can just do the pole right inside your shanty versus the tip ups, which you set up outside. And so certain people have holes in the bottoms of their shanties and some people don't. And that's sort of captured, you know, we sort of captured that additional um, inf information here. I remember when Ned showed me the first label, I was awesome. We needed this. It's, it's bringing also the culture of fish and wildlife into the project, uh, something that I was not aware of and seeing it with a typewriter font and everything, it, it gave the shanty a bio on top of the photo. So, so I love it. I, I also majored in biology. So I think we may have been kind of like unknowingly kind of having this biolog like biologist nexus around our kind of <laughs> portrayal of some of these things. I, I just continue to appreciate how open you were creatively to this process. Uh, it's it's um, it's noteworthy. So you guys might be interested to know that Steve Paisley um, it has registered for the Artful Ice Shanties Design Build Contest that's coming up. Wow. So um, yeah, I think I, I think everyone else. There's like 15 or 16 shanties that people are building and that are going to be out there. Um, and I think everyone else pretty much is coming at it from like an artist uh, builder and like, this will be fun, make an ice shanty. But Steve, Steve contacted us to say, to, to make sure that if he does this, that it can go out on the ice because he's going to use it to fish. Like it doesn't have to be displayed somewhere that will prevent him from being able to use it to fish. So. Um, I, I didn't I, know I, that Steve already had a very artful ice shanty, but I'm excited to see what he comes up I, with. I think I, I may need to uh, go visit and take some photos. I just finished yeah, the project. Yeah, take some photos. <laughs> yeah, think, yeah. It's, we're, 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 we're seeing some in-process photos of what people are working on. Some of them, I think, are like conceptual ice shanties at best, but like incredible sculpture and pieces of art, which is awesome. So, yeah, probably some good photo ops there. Um, I, I want to give everyone one last chance. If you have any questions or comments that you want to chime in with now, you know, please do that. Type them into the Q&A or, or, or click the raise hand button. Otherwise, I think we're going to wrap this up here. Um, I want to thank all three of you w once again, um, not only for this tonight, but for giving us, giving our, the Brattleboro Museum the opportunity to share your great project with the world. It's, it's really been an honor. And we're so grateful to the Vermont Folklife Center, um, such a terrific organization that we're really fortunate to have here in our state. Really love everything the Vermont Folklife Center does. Um, before we sign off, I just want to let everyone know that a recording of this uh, discussion tonight will be available on the museum's website within the next day or two. That's brattleboromuseum.org. So if you missed part of it or you want to be able to share a recording with somebody, you'll find it there, brattleboromuseum.org. That's also where you can find information about the other events we have coming up in the next few weeks related to the ice fishing. Eric Hoffner's talk and panel discussion and this Artful Ice Shanties project. Um, and I also want to say that if you haven't seen the exhibit in person, or even if you have, um, you can always check out the 
interactive virtual tour available on our website. Um, we're really proud of how that came together. It's really well done. It's not quite the same as seeing it in person, but it's still pretty great. And it gives you a sense of what the photos and the labels look like in the space. And you can click and drag around and zoom in. And I think you're able even to like click on an icon that really zooms in on the label so you can see the phone number and then could call in and listen to the audio if you want to. So, um, you know, we started doing these virtual exhibits because it's COVID times and so many people can't make it to the museum right now. Well, it turns out it's, ex you know, extended the reach of our exhibits unbelievably, like in a way we'd never even imagined. And so we're definitely going to stick with it. And um, as I was mentioning to Fed and Ned earlier, um, of all the virtual exhibits we have right up right now, this is the one that's been um, generating the most traffic. Last thing I would like to say is that if you appreciated this event tonight and would like to make a donation to support this type of free programming, we would be very grateful for that, of course. That's something you can also do on our website, brattleboromuseum.org. And I would also suggest that you consider supporting the excellent work of the Vermont Folklife Center, which you can do at their website, which is Vermont Folklife Center, all spelled out, dot org. Um, I think that's it, unless you guys have any last words. Thank you, Ibi, so much for bringing us together tonight. And uh, thank you, Ned. It's great to see you again. And Danny, for having us. Really fun yeah. evening with you guys. <laughs> yeah, this was real fun. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Same here. Well, stay safe, all of you, the, you know, the three of you and everyone out there whose faces I can't see right now. Thank you for being here tonight. Stay, sa stay safe, take care of yourselves and each other, and hope to see you again soon. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks.